there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. World War III and a global depression. They are the twin monsters standing in the living room of the world that few people admit are there. I cannot survey global news headlines every day without seeing an alarming acceleration toward a devastating financial implosion. I'm not talking about a stock market crash. I'm talking about a total financial implosion and a military confrontation between the United States and Russia and China. I honestly don't know how people go through every day without seeing these things and talking about them. It's amazing to me how many people, including Christians are absolutely clueless about the level of danger we're facing right now in June 2015. The United States is ratcheting up its beating of the war drums by deploying troops and heavy equipment, including tanks, armored vehicles, and artillery, to Eastern Europe next to Russia's border. U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter said the military equipment would be placed in Poland, Romania, Latvia, Estonia, and Bulgaria. News of the American deployment of American soldiers and weaponry along Russia's border triggered a furious response from Moscow. Sergei Zagarev, chairman of the Defense Committee of Russia's lower parliamentary house, said Russia may reinforce its military presence in the Baltic exclave of Kaliningrad. Last week, Russian President Putin announced that his country would produce and deploy 40 new nuclear-armed ICBMs this year to meet the growing threat to Russia from the United States and NATO. As America's political, judicial, and military leadership warmly embraces sexual perversion, it is increasingly evident that that God has turned this nation's leaders over to reprobate minds. They truly are lunatics. They are so delusional. They are actively plotting and preparing for simultaneous wars with China and Russia. Only lunatics would behave this way, and I believe that's who Mr. Putin was referring to several weeks ago when he said only A lunatic would think about war. Are you paying close attention to the extreme escalation in cyber attacks and hacking of government and corporate computers in recent months? This is another sign that World War III has already commenced. You have to understand this. The war has already started. The war is being fought every day on different fronts. It will go nuclear later. The latest hacking news is from Russian cyber security firm Kapersky Lab. The company said it will carry out an assessment on the possible risk of attacks on their software products by the NSA and Great Britain's GCHQ. According to the website Intercept, documents released by Edward Snowden reveal that Kapersky Lab had come under relentless NSA and GCHQ cyber attacks. The Snowden document download also revealed that the surveillance agencies are deeply involved in efforts to reverse engineer and disable computer security software, which means that any antivirus, computer security, or encryption software you and I may download 
Well, it's already been compromised by intelligence agencies. In the South China Sea, China is moving quickly to establish a military presence on the artificial islands built on reefs. A Chinese Navy admiral warned days ago that Chinese warships have the right to ram Japanese ships if they approach the Spratly Islands. Furthermore, the PLA Daily reported this week that the People's Liberation Army launched a series of military exercises in late May and early June to practice for an invasion of Taiwan. U.S. military expert Richard Fisher, who appeared on True News last month, said the exercise involved the mobilization of ferries to transport Chinese troops and trucks to Taiwan. The exercise envisions China deploying up to 12 divisions of troops to Taiwan in the event of a war. China's new H-6K strategic bomber also participated in the invasion scenario. As World War III heats up, so too does the fast-moving implosion of the global financial system. The Times of London reported that the European Central Bank increased funding today to keep Greece's banks open another day. And in recent weeks, I've become more outspoken in my belief that we are looking at twin financial disasters, the fall of 2015 and the fall of 2016. The meltdown will commence in the fall of 2015, but it will not reach its full ferociousness until the fall of 2016. I would not be surprised if we experience a 30% plunge in the markets in October of this year. I have invited financial technical analyst and market cycles expert Peter Eliadis to join the program today. Peter is the publisher of the Stock Market Cycles newsletter. His website is stockmarketcycles.com. Peter's on the phone right now. Peter, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Nice to be with you, Rick. Yes, sir. Um, You know, Peter... uh, we could we could talk about a lot of of current events that are taking place right now. The the possibility of Greece uh, defaulting uh, in the next week. Um, we could talk about the tension between the U.S. and Russia and Ukraine. The tension between the U.S. and China uh, in in uh, the Spratly Islands. We could talk about the the BRICS nations formation. All these things. But in in the in the final analysis, Peter, do current world events really dictate what happens in the markets? You know, I go back, oh gosh, I hate to say how far I go back in this business, Rick, but I started my newsletter in 1975 and started market analysis about five years before that. The book that made the biggest impression on me was an old book called The Profit Magic of Stock Transaction Timing. It was about cycles in the market, and it was written by a fellow called J.M. Hurst. And Hurst big point that he made was something that struck me at the time. Uh, Intuitively, I felt that way. And he said that the market has nothing to do with externals like news and whatever. That's not to say that there won't be some kind of quick reaction to a news story uh, and perhaps even a deep reaction to something like, obviously, if they announced World War III tomorrow or if there was an assassination of a president, that would have some kind of quick effect on the market. But if you look back at a chart long-term historically and try to pick out for me what important events caused market turns, it would be impossible to do because there were no important events that caused market turns in the past. They're caused by the internal factors, and I would contend cycles and technical factors in the market. So that was my long way of answering to you that these things that happen that we hear on the news stories every day really have very little overall to do with the stock market. All right. Now, I've, I'm a fairly recent uh, student of cycles. I would, I would say like in the last seven years. And uh, I wish I, I would have known about this uh, many, many years ago. Um, but how, how do you explain to our audience uh, it, what, what are cycles? Okay. There are patterns within the market. Again, when I first started doing this uh, so many years ago, so many decades ago, I I was struck by the fact that after I started reading that book by Hearst about cycles, I started getting stock market charts, and I would count 
the days between bottoms or the days between tops. Mostly at that time it was bottoms because they're, they're the things that I think have most regularity in terms of what's happening with the, in terms of trying to analyze cycles in the market. And I would find that there'd be 27 days between this low and that low and then another 27 days and perhaps uh, 54 days between another group of lows. And when I started counting that out, I got obsessed by it because it seemed to me amazing how, regardless of what was happening in the background of the market, that these cycles were taking place that had nothing to do with fundamentals, and they appeared to be controlling the market at the time. So basically, what cycles are are patterns in the market. They could be counts from bottom to bottom. They could be a count from a bottom to a top. In fact, hopefully we'll discuss today some of the very long-term cycles in the market, uh, cyclic patterns, I should say, that have occurred over the last 200 years, one of which is very, very important to our current analysis of the market. And which one is that? That's something that actually a reader of mine or subscriber of mine back about uh, almost seven or eight years ago now sent me something saying that I don't know if you realize it, but there have been periods in the market of approximately 33 years from very important market lows to very important market highs. And when he first said that, I indeed, was it was not a pattern that I was acquainted with. But whenever anyone mentions something like that, I'm always ready to learn. And so I went back and researched the, this pattern that he spoke about. Uh, 33 years from market bottoms to market tops. He started with uh, the bottom back in uh, October 19, 18, 1857, mind you, not 1957. Uh, and there were 32 years and seven months to important top in May of 1890. There was a very important low of August of 1896. If you go forward 33 years in one month, it takes you to September 1929. That was the high before the crash. If you go to the uh, the low in 1932 after the crash, that's July of 32, and go forward 33 years and seven months, that takes you to February of 1966, a very important top which lasted about 16 years. And then you come into the three bottoms that I think are, are somewhat connected to the market over the past 15 years. There's the low of October of 1966, December of 1974, and August of 1982. Now, let's try and follow this in terms of, of, of my analysis here, Rick. I maintain that the October of 1966 low, if you go forward 33 years and two months, it takes you to the high. Uh, in December, January, December 99, January of, of 2000. Actually, the high in the Dow came in January of 2000. The high in the S&P came in March of 2000. But that's, again, a period, 33 years and two months. If you take the S&P, it would be 33 years and four months. Now let's go forward to the December of 74 bottom. The reason I put these three bottoms together is that they're generally in the same basing period of the Dow, where the Dow was around five, six, seven hundred. The October of 66 low, December of 74 low, again, you go forward from the December of 74 low, you go forward 32 years and 10 months, just two months short of 33 years, that takes us to October of 07. I should not have to tell any of your listeners how important the top we saw in October of 07. That was the top that led to the greatest bear market, percentage-wise, since the 1929 high in the in the uh, in the Dow before the crash. So now we have one low left in that little troika, that little triumvirate of rows of lows. October 66 took us to the high of January of 2000. December of 74 took us to the high of October of 07. Now we have the August of the 82 low. So we don't, we can't say exactly, we, we don't even know if this pattern's gonna continue to work, Rick. But because it has been so consistent in picking very important market tops, um, I obviously wanna look back from August of 82 and go forward anywhere between 32 years and seven months, which has been the shortest span, and 33 years and seven months, which has been the longest span. But most of them have been in that 32 year, seven months to 33 year time span. 
Where does that take us now from August of 82? Well, 32 years and seven months would be March of 2015. If you go to the far outside of that 33 years and seven months, that's March of 2016. I don't think we're going to hold up that long for a lot of other reasons relating to cycles. So the average duration has been 33 years and one month. That would take us to September of 2015. But we are right now in the heart of the period, Rick, starting in March of 2015, where this particular long-term pattern or cycle tells us that we should be looking for an important market top. Oh, Peter, so, so unless there's an anomaly in this cycle, we're looking at some time in the fall of 2015 for a, a, a dramatic change in the market. Well, I don't want to over-dramatize it, Rick, okay. but yes, because, because these tops, these 33-year tops, have been incredibly long-lasting. I mean, we're talking about an average duration from the time the market tops to the time that top is surpassed of a decade, more than a decade, about 14, 15 years. So really what this is telling us, if this pattern continues, if it unfolds this time around, is that we could see a top somewhere between now and the beginning of 2016. And I think the focus point is right here and now, with June of 2015, plus or minus two or three months. We could see a top here that could last for 15 or 20 years. Now, that seems incredible to most people because they've been spoiled with a market which has been come, going up really since 1932, since we saw that bottom in 32, or you could argue since 1974, or you could certainly argue since the 1990 or even 2002. We've had a market, yes, we had a crash in 87, but that was wiped away in about a year. We were at new highs within a year from then. We have not seen a market top that has lasted for a decade or longer since go all the way back in 1966. And we are more than overdue for one. And that's one of the reasons why I believe this 33-year pattern could be very important in this particular time period, Rick. So there would be resistance that the market can't uh, push against, can't, can't uh, excel for, the, for 10 to 15 years? Or exceed, I, mean. I hesitate. I hesitate to call it resistance because uh, when a pattern like this occurs, uh, God only knows what is causing it. I can't tell you what causes it or why mm -hmm. the market stops at these particular points. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are. I do have a couple of trend lines that I use, but I'm not going to go into that now, Rick. Because first of all, we don't have the visual aids to point them out to people. It wouldn't be difficult to understand if we did. But let me just say that uh, if there's one particular trend line that has become kind of a barrier or a stop for the market, and we have been rubbing up against it now for the past two or three months on both the Dow and the S&P. On the S&P, that barrier is right around the 2130, 35 level. We've gone up to that level a couple of times or close to it a couple of times in the past few months. And that the level is slowly rising. It's like 1.3 points per week, I believe. So, yes, there is that, again, I hesitate to call it a physical barrier, but there is that technical barrier that is keeping prices down every time we come up and hit that particular line. The most important thing, however, for me has been this long-term pattern. Let me give you one other pattern that kind of that, that kind of adds to the importance of this one, Rick. There have been an incredible amount of time zones. In fact, um, in the material that I that I sent you folks before we did this interview, uh, I sent one of my favorite charts is uh, a chart that shows how many patterns there have been in the market that are approximately 150 months apart. They run 150, 100, as small as 147, but most of them are 150 months apart. And let me mention a couple of them for people that might recognize some of the dates that I'm going to give them. Uh, if you go all the way back to the, the September of 1929 high, very important high, which led to the crash going into 1932. If you go forward 150 months from there, that takes you exactly to the very major bottom in April of 1942. 
by the way, 150 months for people that don't want to sit there and do the math, works out to be exactly 12 and a half years. So 12.5 times 12 would be 150. So from September of 29 to April of 42, that's 150 months. There are so many of them out there. Uh, let, let me give you one more. If you go from the, uh, the top in uh, the pre-crash top in 1987, uh, August, September of 1987, you go forward 149 months from there, that takes you again to January of 2000. Uh, a period of 149 months. I could go back and list 10 or 12 of these for you in the last 50 years, Rick. I'm not going to do that. But the reason I brought it up is that we now are looking at a time zone where if we look back 150 months, there were two important market turning points. One of them occurred in October of 2002, and the other one was kind of a double bottom with the October of 2002 bottom in March of 2003. If we go forward 150 months from each of those bottoms, that takes us into the time zone that we're in again right now. You go forward 150 months from October of, of uh, 2002. Let's count on our fingers. October, November, December, January, February, March, April. That takes us to April of 2015. And again, the, it's 150 months plus or minus one or two months. So, so far, the all-time high in the market has occurred in May. So that extends it out to 151 months. That means that based on this cycle alone, there's a possibility that that May time frame, that May high that we saw, could work out to be an all-time high, a very important high. But we don't know the answer to that yet because we also have to allow for the fact that if the, uh, the uh, March of 2003 bottom is the one that's going to come up with 150 months, that carries out into September of this year. So the point that I'm trying to make is there are so many cyclic patterns, long-term ones. When I say long-term, I mean longer than a decade. This particular one is 150 months or 12 and a half years that are pointing very strongly into this focus area of May, June, July, August of 2015. Uh, that's why I believe that there's an excellent chance that we see a very major market top occur in this area. Amazing. This, this time zone. So to, to recap and to summarize this, if, if these cyclic patterns hold true to their historical consistency and we don't have an anomaly, right. then personally, what, what are you anticipating could we could be looking at this summer this fall okay sometime between the summer and the fall probably uh, i believe that that for whatever reason and there may be some kind of reason attributed to it uh something happens in greece or some kind of crazy thing happens usually there are reasons that that the media has to come up with to attribute the reason as to why the stock market did what it did so for whatever reason we may see we may there's a couple of ways it may take it may, it, it may it may happen rick one of them might be that we wake up one morning and say oh my god the market's down five percent overnight or ten percent overnight uh something like that might happen where no one knows why in the world it happened and one of the basic reasons something like this happens is we can go if you want to talk fundamentals as a person whom i greatly respect his name is john Huspin. And he has a website that your listeners can go to called HussmanFunds.com. He does great fundamental analysis in terms of valuation for the market, things that have worked for the past 100 years in terms of looking at uh, the particular uh, fundamental formations he points out to in terms of earnings or dividend yields or whatever. And we are now at what he considers to be either the most overvalued or the second most overvalued time span in market history. And this goes back for a couple of hundred years. So when when you get into that ionosphere of market valuation, that's when you're most vulnerable to see a crash. I'm not predicting a crash is going to happen, but we are set up for something like that to happen because of where we stand overvaluation-wise and because of where we stand cyclically. So for that reason, we could well see, 
wake up some morning or watch some day as the market goes down five or ten percent in one day. And in this case, I don't think it's going to be a one day wonder or a one week or one month wonder. I think that's going to be the kickoff move to the downside that's going to tell us that indeed we have begun what could be a very painful and long term bear market. I don't think the next bear market is going to last six months or a year or 14, 16 months like the, the big one that we saw from October of 07 to March of 09, even though we went down greater than 50%, one of the great declines in market history in terms of a bear market. It only took a little over a year. It took like a year, maybe a year and four, five, six months. This next bear market, the cycles are telling me, is going to be something that goes on for a long period of time, as we said earlier, perhaps even a decade or longer. So as to how it begins, it could begin with little chips that are taken off the block and then slowly but surely gain momentum, or it could indeed begin with a crash. But I think, again, we are in the time zone between now and, for me, September, October, at the latest, Rick, that we start to see the underpinnings of the market really start falling apart. Peter, I've been telling my audience in recent weeks, and, and I'm saying this entirely as a as, as a layman. I'm I'm you know I'm a church pastor, all right. I'm I'm not a trader, and uh, what I've been um, telling our our audience is I'm the image I'm getting in my mind is that fall 2015 and fall 2016 are bookends, and something begins in the fall of 2015, and it. It accelerates in the fall of 2016. Um, do, do you see anything in, in the cycles that would indicate that kind of scenario is shaping up? Absolutely. That wouldn't surprise me at all. That I, I, I could give you a scenario where that will take place, Rick, and that would be this. Sometime, as I said, between now and September, October, at the very latest, although I don't think it will hold up that long, the market begins a very significant decline. And when I say very significant, I'm talking about at least 35 40%. And it could be a crash-like decline because it could happen so quickly going into 2016. And indeed, we could see what could turn out to be some kind of market bottom in 2016 that might last for a year or longer. But unfortunately, it'll be significantly lower from where we are now. As I said, I believe... 30, 35 to 40 percent lower. At that point, we could get a base building period from that 2016 time period that would carry for another year or two, maybe longer. I don't think so. But those two bookends of yours could very well form a market top and a market bottom that might last for a year or two. All right, Peter, we appreciate your insight. Thank you for coming by True News today. My pleasure. It's nice to talk with you, Rick. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Proverbs 12, verse 15 says, The way of a fool seems right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. With some reflections on godly counsel, here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. In the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, the Lord sent Nathan to provide godly counsel to King David. And here's what happened. He had committed sin against God and, of course, against himself by committing adultery with Bathsheba. And being the king, he had everything arranged so that it would all be covered. Yet what he did not realize is that God was going to confront him. And so he sent him Nathan the prophet. And it's interesting how... Nathan counseled David. So I want you to listen to these few verses. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. Well, immediately David would relate to that. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And the traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb 
and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this thing shall die. And listen to what the scripture says. And he shall restore fourfold all the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Then he begins to talk about how he blessed him. Now what I want you to see here is this, that David the king, in spite of his position, still needed godly counsel at this point in his life. And God sent the right person. As far as David was concerned, everything was fine. But God knew there was another side to it. And because he loved him and because he cared, he sent a message, a very strong message. And it may be that sometimes you and I don't like counsel because it's painful, because it's convicting. Sometimes we face decisions in life that that are very difficult decisions. We've never walked that way before, and so we need godly counsel. One of the primary reasons people do not seek counsel is they're too proud. They think, well, if they seek counsel, that's a sign of weakness. It is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of wisdom to seek godly counsel. You're listening to True News. We are your daily vaccine to protect your mind from mental viruses spread by the establishment news media. I'm Rick Wiles. Satan has been attacking the inerrancy of the Word of God ever since the Garden of Eden. But in recent years, Lucifer has launched a surprise D-Day style invasion of evil and wickedness that has, quite frankly, caught the church off guard and unprepared to launch a counter-offensive Satan is a very shrewd strategist. He devoted decades cultivating moral, cultural, and spiritual conditions that would be necessary for him to assault the church at an appointed time. And that time is now. Wickedness and evil are strutting on the world stage, and the church is largely silent and impotent to respond in a forceful manner. A significant reason for the lack of response from the church to this unprecedented wave of wickedness and rebellion is that many modern Christians are devoid of sound doctrine. The lack of sound doctrine is the result of weak preaching and teaching in the pulpits over decades and the failure of church members to study the Word of God. This weak condition in the church did not happen overnight. We are reaping the harvest of decades of faulty doctrines and failure to study the Bible. My guest today has devoted his entire life to fighting this slide away from sound doctrine. Dr. Norman Geisler is a prolific author who has written or co-written nearly 100 books and hundreds of articles. He's also a highly respected theologian, seminary professor, and speaker. The list of books written by Dr. Geisler are too numerous to mention, but include I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. 12 points that show Christianity is true, the big book of apologetics, the Jesus quest, the danger from within. His latest book is The Bible's Answer to 100 of Life's Biggest Questions. Dr. Geisler, welcome to True News. Well, what a privilege to be with you. Well, sir, I'm honored to have you on the program. Um, Sir, this, uh, you know, the USA is... uh, And the West, the entire Western world, is suffering an unprecedented wave of rebellion against God. How do you account for this wave of evil and rebellion? Well, uh, by the way, uh, your introduction uh, hit it right on the head. I couldn't uh, uh, hardly hold myself back from saying amen, amen, amen. Oh, you can say Uh, amen on this program. It's okay. (laughs) I didn't know if I could do it while you were reading the introduction. (laughs) Uh, We account for it because... uh, there is, there is a devil, and there are fallen human beings here, and the combination is dangerous. Um, you know, we're reaping we're reaping the harvest of tares that were sown decades ago. I mean, this Absolutely. this this rebellion just didn't spring up. Uh, these tares were planted in the country decades ago, and now the tares have grown up. 
you know, they're blooming and they're going to seed. And, and yeah, absolutely right. In terms of uh, the history of our country, you know, we were uh, Judeo-Christian uh, in our ethic from uh, day one, which would be, you know, way back in uh, 1620, uh, to about 1960. And then things started to fall apart, and they fell apart because uh, 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 we allowed uh, evil to take over, and we allowed uh, 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 sin to uh, occur in, in our uh, churches and in our Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled between 1960 and 1990 that uh, the Declaration of Independence is unconstitutional. You can't... Uh, um, of God, uh, creation, or God-given moral absolutes. We took the Bible out of school. We took prayer out of school. We took the Ten Commandments out of, out of school, and then we wonder why it went to the devil. You know, Christians are, are, and you know, conservative citizens, whether they're religious or not, typically are unaware that the people who are. Um, let's say socialists, progressives, communists, Marxists, whatever you want to call them, um, that they are very diligent in organizing politically. And that is their religion, uh, a a political movement. That's their religion, and they are zealous about it. And and so I think think a lot of Christians were simply unaware that over the last five decades, this Antichrist movement, crowd in the country was busy. I mean, they were holding meetings. They were strategizing. They were implementing their plan. And all of a sudden, in in the last, uh, you know, six, seven, eight years, their plan has been brought to fruition. And everyone's wondering, how did this happen? Yeah, absolutely. It happened gradually. Uh, You know, if you uh, take an airplane with uh, propellers on it and take your hand Uh, off the um, steering mechanism, it will naturally go left uh, unless you steer it to the right. So you got to steer to the right in order to go straight. And the uh, church didn't do that, and our society didn't do it. And we withdrew from our society, and we we let the uh, unbelievers, the liberals and skeptics, agnostics take over, and they took over and turned a country that believed in freedom of religion to a country that believes in freedom from religion. And so we have no moral standards. We have no absolutes. So we've taken creator, creation, God-given moral absolutes out. And when you, uh, the country less God is a God less country. You don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure that out. I think it was 1987, two homosexual activists published a book that outlined the strategy to change American society. And I, I reviewed it. I didn't read the entire book, uh, but I reviewed the main points recently, and I was just shocked that we as the church were totally ignorant of the plan that was implemented and carried out for several decades. And now, here in 2015, we're, we're wondering, how, how could it be that uh, transvestites are being paraded on television as as models, as as goddesses. Right. How did this happen? Well, if you read this book from 1987, it tells you exactly how they were going to change the society. Well, they uh, did. Uh, they they did, and it worked. And uh, now we're uh, just waiting with uh, bated breath for the Supreme Court to. Uh, put the icing on the cake for them, and short of a miracle, uh, we're going to be in deep trouble within a few weeks when the Supreme Court rules on this. Everybody anticipates that they're going to rule approvingly of uh, gay marriage, and if that's so, uh, we're going to be put on the defensive. We're going to be squirming around for religious freedom. We won't be able to eventually even preach the sections of the Bible like Leviticus 18 and Romans 1 that speak against homosexuality because uh, uh, we'll be homophobes if we do. Assuming that the Lord doesn't come back very soon and life goes on for quite some time, 
you know, it seems to me, Dr. Geisler, that if the church corporately got together this year and said, okay, we, you know, we've got to come up with a battle plan to take back society, we're looking at a 50-year battle. It took them uh, that long. When you consider that we were a Judeo-Christian country in our ethics from 1620 to 1960, and in 1961 they ruled that uh, you can, uh, in Torcaso v. Watkins, that you don't have to believe in God to be uh, religious, uh, that atheism and humanism are acceptable uh, views protected by the Constitution, and then 62, 63, no prayer, no Bible reading, 1980, uh, no Ten Commandments, 1980 uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, 1982, I was in the, um, I was in Dallas, and uh, I was called to be a witness in the uh, uh, creation evolution trial. Uh, which ended by saying that you can't teach uh, creation alongside of evolution in the public schools. So uh, I went on to the Supreme Court, and they confirmed uh, that. So here we are in a country uh, that was founded on the Constitution. That's our original document, 1776. It says, Creator, creation, and God-given moral absolutes that can't teach any of those without violating the Constitution is interpreted by our liberal Supreme Court. So it happened gradually uh, over a period of years, uh, starting with 1933, um, 1931, when the humanists declared themselves a religion, and then when John Dewey uh, taught all of the uh, teachers what to teach humanism and even called it a religious movement, uh, and gradually it took over until we elected Supreme Court justices and a majority of them that have uh, turned our country upside down. So if you really look at it, it took them a good 50 years or more to accomplish what uh, they uh, were doing to turn the country upside down. And it will take that long for us to turn it right side up. It seems to me that we Christians simply overlook the most basic Bible lesson at the beginning of the book in Genesis, which is when Lucifer entered the garden as a serpent and attacked the Word of God to Eve, and Adam failed to do his duty. He was told by God to tend to the garden, to take care of the garden. And if he had been doing his job, he would have seen that rascal, and tossed him out of the garden. And so, we as Christians, we have not been doing our job. We've allowed the serpent to, to just roam around freely. And so now we've got to figure out how, it's, we don't have just one serpent now, we've, we've got millions of serpents in this country. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to need Patrick you know, to drive the snakes out of this country right now. I mean, look at, talking to Patrick, look what's happened to Ireland. Mm-hmm. So, um, it just seems to me, Dr. Geisler, we just failed as a church just to, to heed the most basic biblical lesson, that is to tend to the garden. Uh, be busy taking care of the garden. Protect the garden from the snake. And uh, we, we allowed the snake in. We allowed Lucifer to run free in this country. Is this, a t- is this campaign for a gender-free society actually an attack on creation? Yes, it is. It's an attack on the created order, and God created them male and female. And uh, uh, even nature teaches that, Romans 1, and uh, and homosexuality is contrary uh, to nature. It's contrary uh, to the Scripture, and we we allowed it to happen. The the key words in the Gospels or in in Genesis there are, hath God said. You know, you sure God said, and once you deny... What God said is absolutely true, uh, and give Satan a toehold, uh, he's, he's going to use it. Um, your new book, uh, The Bible's Answers to 100 of Life's Biggest Questions, what are some of those questions you answer in that book? 
We answer questions about just about everything. If you if somebody has an important question, it's there with a hundred of them. You know, questions about God and truth and creation, science, and the Bible, about the Holy Spirit, about heaven, hell, demons, and end, end times, about Christian life, about uh, how we should involve ourselves in the culture of our day. Uh, uh, questions about family. Uh, you name it, and uh, we have not only a question but a short answer. We live in a soundbite generation. We have a short answer, and then at the end of the answer, we have uh, sources, uh, written sources, DVDs, uh, uh, video sources, uh, uh, internet sources, so people can go into it more deeply. So it's a it's a guide. You know, you don't have to read the whole book. You just look up what question you want, and then uh, follow the. Uh, uh, sources at the end. Um, my uh, favorite thing to do on on the weekends is to is to, besides studying the Word of God, is to read church history. I love studying early church history and the Protestant Reformation church history. And I, I guess I'm a Calvinistic Arminian. I don't know how to describe uh, my, uh, my, Calvinian. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So so our um, were are Calvin's present day followers more Calvinistic than John Calvin was? Yes, they are. Uh, I wrote a book on that called "Chosen but Free." Uh, the, the present uh, Calvin was more moderately uh, Calvinistic than they are. They're more extreme, but that's true. You know, uh, Aristotle's uh, disciples took his view to extreme. Almost every group of disciples takes their their master teachers uh, teachings to the extreme and we we need to get back to a biblical balance of view which uh, uh, finds uh, the truth that's uh, in Calvinism the truth that's in Arminianism there's truth in both views and we need to emphasize that what's the balanced view between predestination and free will that God uh, foreknew what everyone was going to choose. So they are free in that they freely chose. It's certain in that God foreknew it, and what he foreknows he can't be wrong about. So God knew for sure, therefore it's determined what we're freely going to do. Therefore it's free. Um, what is... Uh, um, I know you've also written about the last days, and it, you, you produced, you, you wrote and published a, a four-volume um, book on theology. What, what is, uh, you know, we've got only about f- five, six minutes uh, remaining. Can, can you tell us uh, the, about the last days in five minutes? Well, the last days uh, are going to uh, be days of uh, tribulation. The Bible talks about a period of tribulation generally. Uh, thought to be seven years long, in which the Antichrist uh, is going to set up himself in the Temple of God, which is rebuilt in, in Jerusalem, claims to be God, puts 666 on uh, people uh, who won't, uh, so that everybody uh, has to buy or sell, uh, uh, agree with the uh, Antichrist. Uh, it's kind of like the credit card of the last day. Things are going to get worse until... Uh, and worse, during the tribulation, God's going to send judgment down on the earth. At the end of the tribulation uh, period, Jesus is going to return to earth, having taken his saints to heaven uh, before, and he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to reign for a thousand years. The devil's going to be tied up, so they can't say, the devil made me do it. And every age or dispensation, the devil is always free, so God ties him up for a thousand years. At the end, they rebel uh, against him is in the number is the sands of the sea. Fire comes down from heaven, destroys them. There's a great white throne, and uh, all unsaved people stand before, and those whose names aren't written in the book are cast into the uh, lake of fire. And then uh, the dawning of the new day, the new heavens and the new earth come, uh, and all sin, evil, uh, Satan, are done away with forever. Do, do you believe that there is a secret pre-tribulation rapture? I believe that there is a, a pre-tribulation rapture because 
the Bible says God has not appointed us unto the wrath and the first Thessalonians 5 uh, 9 and also it says in Revelation 3.10 that uh, he's going to keep us from the hour uh, tribulation is coming on the earth and uh, uh, it's always God's uh, way of working to not judge the righteous with the wicked Sodom and Gomorrah for example uh, Enoch uh, was taken before, and God uh, delivered uh, the people who were righteous uh, from it, and then he cast his judgment down on, on the earth. But uh, I I think that uh, uh, that's not the important thing, uh, which in of the tribulation people come up. The important thing is that Jesus is coming. He, come, he could come at any moment, uh, and that we ought to be ready uh, for him uh, coming at any moment, and uh, after he uh, comes uh, to get us, things are going to get far worse on the world because once you take all the Christians out of the world, you left a tremendous spiritual and moral vacuum uh, there, and the world is uh, literally going to go to the devil uh, there until the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back and judges uh, the world and the nations and sets up his kingdom. Do, do you think the Syrian and Iraqi Christians are suffering tribulation right now? I think uh, uh, every believer, Second Timothy three, twelve, yea, all who will live godly, Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So every true believer uh, suffers some kind of uh, tribulation, uh, but not the tribulation. And the tribulation is uh, a special time of. Uh, period of judgment Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and 25 and uh, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah and Daniel 9 uh, it's Daniel's last week determined on the people of Israel so I, I think that's a special time of tribulation though Christians today experience uh, tribulation it's not going to be anything like the great tribulation you think Americans are going to suffer beheadings and horrific uh, violence like uh, our Middle Eastern and African brethren are suffering? Yeah, we already are to some degree. I think we're going to uh, experience the same thing, and I think it's going to be even worse uh, during the uh, Great Tribulation because, you know, basically when you look at the judgments there in the book of uh, Revelation, you have, uh, you know, one-third of the earth taken in one judgment, another third taken in another judgment. We don't have anything like that occurring yet, thank God. Uh, the world is, is moving rapidly toward harmonizing a, a system of biometric uh, identification, facial recognition, and so forth. Um, major banks have announced that they are uh, switching their platforms to biometric identification for people to access ATMs and uh, of course, uh, the phones, uh, the smartphones are switching over to biometric, and you know this is uh, this is clearly the the trend. Uh, you know, we don't know if this is um, you know the mark of the beast or the uh, forerunner of it. But does uh, biometric identification, uh, scanning of your eyes and your fingers, does that uh, upset you? Well. Uh I know what's going to happen eventually, and, uh, you know, it makes sense, because if you want an uh, infallible way of telling who's who, uh, just stick uh, uh, 666 on their forehands or their forehead, you know, and you, you, you're not going to walk in the bank with some, cut somebody else's hand off and, and walk in the bank. Uh, as I said, you'd be caught red-handed uh, if you uh, uh, did that. So it's a it's a perfect system. Should, uh, should perfect. Christians participate in biometric scanning right now in 2015? Well, uh, if it's not, uh, if it doesn't have 666 on it and you're not worshiping uh, the Antichrist, uh, I don't think there's an adherence in it. And on the other hand... When does it cross the line? When do you know that you have, you've crossed the line and you have accepted that mark? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think the, the answer is when... Uh, when it's uh, 666 and uh, it's done by the Antichrist and you can't buy or sell them, uh, anything unless you uh, take 
uh, that sign, and uh, uh, the Bible is very clear that uh, that's of Satan and uh, should be resisted. Uh, in in recent months, there have there's been a uh, plethora of articles published in financial publications such as the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times about the need to go to a cashless society right away. And I, I suspect that the international bankers are, um, they know that they they have run um, out as far as they can go with quantitative easing and debasing the currency, and they've just got to get rid of money and just make it all digital. But I can see how if we have a global financial meltdown in the next 24 months, which is very likely, I can see how suddenly we could be told that we are now a cashless world, and yes. and you will you will submit to biometric scanning if you want to access your cash, or well, you don't have any cash if you want to access yeah. your wealth yeah. and if you want to do any transactions. So, Doctor Geisler, are we Christians facing the mark of the beast right now? I don't think we're facing the mark of the beast right now, but I think we're set. You know, we're we're in the setting of the stage uh, for it, and we can see what direction it's going. And I think Christians uh, uh, right now should be very careful what they do. I I believe in investing in gold and silver, for example, to uh, avoid that as much as possible. But eventually, uh, they'll take control of that too. Can, so. can- Last question. Can you say with absolute certainty to our audience that they will be raptured out of this world before the mark of the beast is implemented? I, there are very few things you can say with absolute certainty. I know I exist, and I know that it's very highly, highly probable that God exists in the Bible's Word of God. But when it comes to details of prophecy... You can't say uh, most things with absolute certainty, or if you do, you're absolutely wrong. So it's possible in your mind that the mark of the beast could appear before the church is taken out. And Christians will have to die or accept the mark. That's possible. If the the mid-trib or post-trib views are correct, then it's possible. Uh, They're not... Uh, they're held by many Christians, and uh, the preacher view is not uh, held with absolute certainty, so it's certainly possible. I think we're going to find out fairly soon. Uh, yeah. Things are moving very fast. Well, I can tell you how if, uh, if uh, a world leader who's got ten nations uh, under him sets up a treaty with Israel for seven years, tells them they can rebuild uh, their uh, temple, uh, then the, the tribulation has begun. If three and a half years go by and he sets up himself and says, worship me, uh, then uh, you know that we're in the middle of the tribulation. Well, my guest has been Dr. Norman Geisler, and his latest book is The Bible's Answers to 100 of Life's Biggest Questions. Thank you, sir. Enjoyed having you right, here today. My privilege. God bless you. All right. Well, that's it for today's program. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate you devoting an hour of your time with me. I also appreciate your prayers for our support and our protection and the Lord's direction and guidance on this ministry. I wish I could tell you all the things that are going on inside this ministry. We are doing some very exciting things for the near future. The Lord has something big planned and We hope to start rolling it out uh, late this summer, early fall of 2015. Keep us in your prayers, and if possible, in the coming week, give a generous gift to the support of True News. Go to truenews.com. If you use PayPal, the address is support at truenews.com. Love you. See you tomorrow.